Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to see each and every one of you here this morning. Please be seated. And of course, we're very glad to have Tom back with us. Uh, and also, all of you joining us. Oh, yeah, exactly. It felt very Thank empty you. next to me the last few weeks, so uh, it seems like a long time. Putting so. my arm around Paul in the pulpit and looking at each of your faces is home. <laughs> And to all of you joining us online, we're glad you're with us as well. And for our gathering of choruses, this morning we're going to sing Jesus, name of all names, and praise the name of Jesus.
seated and we invite the children forward. Suddenly, within 15 minutes, the sun was up and the darkness was gone, and I could see everywhere. And you know what that's like. It's dark at night, it's bright during the day. And as I was thinking about the alarm on my phone, and as I was thinking about the sunrise and, and the brightness of the day, I thought of a Bible verse that talks about whether or not God sleeps. Do you think God sleeps? <laughs> well, that is a great answer, yes or no. That's awesome. The Bible actually says that God never sleeps. God doesn't need an alarm clock to wake him up. God is always awake. And what that means is that God is around you, and he sees you, and he's listening to you, whether it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon or 2 o'clock in the morning and you've woken up in the middle of the night, any time we can talk to God and we can tell Him how we feel and we can yell at Him and we can thank Him, we can tell Him exactly what's going on and because He loves and cares about us, He's always listening and He never sleeps. He's always awake so He can be there for us. And why don't we pray together, and let's, let's thank them for that. So if you repeat after me, dear God, thank you for this day, and for your promises, including the fact that you are always awake, always listening to me, and always caring about me. Please bless me, and keep me safe. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And as we bow our heads and have our prayer of confession, let us pray. Loving Father, you have provided us with the gift of faith. But we confess to you that so often we lose heart. You invite us to be persistent in our faith, but we tend to turn away from you and conclude that you have abandoned us when our prayers are not answered the way we think or we want. Lord, you teach us truth, but there are times we prefer teachers who tell us what we want to hear. You tell us to seek your kingdom first, but so often we seek what we want first. And so we pray to you, dear Lord, and ask you to forgive us. We ask you to write your law on our hearts so that each one of us will live each and every day from your perspective, with your thoughts, with your words in our hearts, and live out our lives doing your actions in this world. Forgive us, Lord, for the sake of your mercy and your grace, and give us second chances and renewed opportunities to live for you with greater consistency and greater holiness than we have ever known before. And all these things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the good news. We are a forgiven people. We are set free from our past failures to make a fresh start 
not just this day, but each and every day. The Holy Spirit empowers us to love God and to love others. Thanks be to God for his everlasting grace. Amen. And I invite you now to turn in your pew Bibles to page 489, and we would like to ask Kathy to come forward and lead us. Have you ever wondered if all of your hard work matters? All of the hard work at your job, all of the ways that you've sacrificed for your family, all of the ways that you've tried to be a good person, chosen to be kind when it wasn't easy, or walked away when you had a right for justice. All the times you've made the effort to come to church when other family members can't be bothered, all the prayers that you've prayed, all the times that you said grace before meals, have you ever wondered if it actually makes a difference? I'm here to remind you that it does. Indeed, it matters, and here's why. Josh, can you please put the picture on screen? This is the ruins of the ancient, ancient fortress Masada, located in the south of Israel near the Dead Sea. It was built by Herod the Great more than 2,000 years ago. It was the final refuge for nearly 1,000 Jews before it was overrun by Roman soldiers. Then the sands of time covered it and it was lost. 
It was rediscovered in the 19th century and American missionary Samuel Wolcott was the first modern person to climb it. But it wasn't until the 1960s that serious excavation was done on the site and that excavation continues to this day. Which brings me to my point. In 2005, an archaeologist discovered something incredible at that site. An archaeologist discovered a tiny seed. Agricultural experts identified the tiny seed as a Judean date palm from a type of palm called Methuselah's variety. Now here's the thing about that particular type of seed. The Methuselah's variety Judean date palm were all wiped out by 500 AD. In short, this type of date palm does not grow anywhere in the world. But in 2005, Eli Soloway, a Jewish agricultural expert, was given permission to see if it would grow. It germinated. And today it continues to grow as a th thriving Judean date palm tree. Josh, next picture please. And there it is. Remarkable, isn't it? A present day palm tree, a world phenomena, one of its kind, healthy and growing, a palm tree growing from a seed that is 2,000 years old. And with this in mind, I'd like you to turn in your pew bottles to our scripture reading today, which is found in the Gospel of Matthew, the 13th chapter, reading verses 24 to 35. And you'll find this on page 14 in your New Testament section. Matthew chapter 13, beginning to read at verse 24. <clears throat> Matthew 13, beginning at the 24th verse. He that is Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, when the weeds appeared as well, and the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at the harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. I've chosen this section of Matthew 13 intentionally because I want you to notice what comes at the beginning of this scripture reading. Jesus is teaching the parable of the weeds and the wheat. And this is not a good news story. An enemy has come and sowed wheat, weed, sorry, weeds in a farmer's fields to destroy the farmer's crop. And notice the actions of the farmer. 
Does the farmer take justice into his own hands and burn down the farm of his enemy and destroy him? No, he doesn't. In fact, he chooses to put his enemy right out of his mind, and instead he looks ahead to the harvest. He allows the wheat to grow, and even though it is surrounded by weeds, the wheat grows. Your faith is like that wheat. Your faith can grow even though it is surrounded by weeds. And we can get mad at the weeds, and we can fuss, and we can fume about the weeds, and we can say it isn't fair, and we can grumble and complain and say that no one appreciates what we've done. We can even become bitter and look at how hard we've worked and how we've sacrificed and pray and say that none of it matters. But if we do that, all we're doing is focusing on the weeds. We are letting the weeds win. Instead, we need to follow the example of the farmer. Because the farmer was right. He said, I'm not even going to think about the weeds. I'm going to focus on the wheat. I'm going to focus on my faith, and I am going to watch it grow. But we argue against that line of thinking. And we say that we don't have that kind of faith because our faith is too small for anything to grow. Please open your Bibles again to Matthew chapter 13. And let's read verses 31 and 32. Page 14. Matthew chapter 13. Verses 31 and 32. And he that is Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. And now if you will flip over just a couple pages... To Matthew chapter 17, which you'll find on page 19, over a few pages, Matthew chapter 17, and I actually would like us to read this verse out loud, beginning with the words, for truly I tell you, Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, and if you'll read that out loud with me, for truly I tell you. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Everyone who is here today has at least the size of, at least the size of a mustard seed of faith. Everyone who is watching online has faith at least the size of a mustard seed. And about the mustard-sized seed of your faith, Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, nothing, nothing will be impossible for you. In other words, nothing will stop your faith from growing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing that is except for ourselves if we're focused on the weeds. So church family, let's cause our faith to grow. Every morning, let's choose to be positive. Every day, let's resolve that we're going to look at the good that is around us. Let's make the conscious decision that we are not going to focus on the weeds. We are going to focus on our faith. And let's pray. Let's resolve that we are going to pray and talk to God throughout the day. Not just when we are having problems and we want His help. Let's choose to talk to Him about everything. To praise Him for the good things that are happening. And to ask His advice and help as we live our lives each and every day. 
Let's choose to look at each day and focus on the things that we have to be thankful for and to thank God for them. In fact, at the end of this service, I encourage you to grow your faith by turning to someone around you and asking them, asking them about themselves, encouraging them in some way. Let your voice, even at the end of this service, be the voice and the heart of Jesus to someone around you. This too is one tiny way that we can intentionally allow our faith to grow. And what's the payoff? Well, that Methuselah palm date tree in Israel, it is growing right now because Eli Soloway choose, chose to plant a seed that is 2,000 years old to see if it would grow. And God is using your prayers and your words of testimony and your heart of gratitude and your effort to make time for church and worship and the Bible stories that you read to your children and your grandchildren and your commitment to bring them to church and all the ways you speak to them about your faith and why it is important. God is using all of that for something that you may not be able to see right now. But like the seed that was 2,000 years old that is now growing, God is able to grow faith in you that will blossom next week and next month and next year and even generations from now in your family because of the choices that you have made for your faith to grow and how it will make a lasting impact on them. All it takes is a little tiny bit of faith, a minute amount, even something the size of a mustard seed. But when you water it with your prayers and with your love and all the ways you seek to live out your faith each and every day, with God's power at work in your life, your faith will blossom and grow into something far greater than you can even imagine. Because as Jesus himself said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, nothing will be impossible for you. And now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And as we prepare, oh, oh, sorry, getting ahead of myself, <laughs> let's sing together. As we think about growing our faith in the ball, there is a flower.
Hello. Um, this is a reminder that we have our youth group CIA tomorrow night at 6.30. And just a special reminder that tomorrow is going to be our Halloween party, so if you want to come dressed in a costume or a spooky themed t-shirt, our only rules are no blood, no guts, no gore. <laughs> and <laughs> I have to specify that. Um, and also, we're going to be doing a little bit of trick-or-treating with each other, so bring your favorite kind of candy to share. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Sounds like fun. Yeah, can the rest of us come? Stop and I are going to And we want to acknowledge that the flowers at the front of the sanctuary are here in loving memory of Thelma Seaman. And as you know, Thelma passed away a week ago Thursday, and her funeral service was held here at this past Thursday. And so the love and prayers of our church family are extended to all the Seaman family. And actually, we have another uh, announcement for you about fun scripts. So I invite Lloyd to come forward. And he's, as he's making his way forward, we just want to remind you, next Sunday at 1030 is our annual Remembrance Day service. So we'll have special music, um, an act of remembrance, and of course, a drama from Tom on a soldier from the First World War. So we're looking forward to that next week. Lloyd? Uh, so the fun, fun script team thought it might be a good idea uh, just to make a, a brief announcement or explanation for those that might not know what this uh, fun script that we speak about every week uh, actually is. So uh, just for, for everyone's information that may not be aware, it's a fundraising program that uh, we've been doing for many years here at St. Mark's and other churches do it as well. But it's a method of fundraising where you buy gift cards for various places like grocery stores, Sobeys or Esso or whatever. Uh, and uh, when you buy the gift card, the church receives a commission for the sale of that gift card. So if you bought a $100 gift card, the commission ranges and it varies depending on, on what organization you buy cards for. So if it's Esso or Sobeys, uh, Walmart, Indigo, where it, it ranges between two and a half to seven percent in some cases, and sometimes they'll have specials where you get even a higher commission. So you get, if you bought a hundred dollar gift card at say SO, you get the hundred dollar gift card obviously, uh, but the church gets a five dollar commission on that, and you get a tax receipt for the commission. So whatever goes to the church gets recorded as a donation in your name, uh, and you get a receipt for that at the end of the year. So it's really a win-win-win. The, the tax receipt and the church gets the cash. So it's, a, it's a great fundraiser. Uh, so you, one way of giving to the church while you're doing what you would normally do anyway, buying groceries and putting gas in the car. So uh, we encourage everyone to, to take advantage of that. There's an order going in today. Uh, so you can see Lois uh, McFadgen or Liz Grimmett. And then there'll be three more before Christmas uh, on November 12th, 26th, and December 10th. So about every two weeks. And you can also order online if you don't want to fill out the forms and, and write a check. You can, you can go online and just tick that it's for St. Mark's Church. So thank you to everyone that already participates in it. And thank you to uh, Lois and Liz for, for their work in, in managing it for us uh, every week. So thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. And as Lloyd said, it's a win-win-win because you get the gift card for the amount that you purchase, but the church gets a commission on it because we've sold the gift card. So it's a, a great way to give a little extra. And as Lloyd said, um, orders are going in today and then every other week. And as you know, people love getting gift cards at Christmas. So um, we'll have a list of all the different ones. Most of them are listed on the form, but there are even more than are actually listed on the form. So. Please uh, speak to Lois or Liz after the service. We would like to gratefully acknowledge that today's bulletin has been generously donated by Jack Tarr and Janice Targi in loving memory of Marion Tarr, Joanne Tarr Pellerin, and Jacques Pellerin. And thank you for that. And as we prepare for prayer, the choir is going to sing Disciples of Christ.
Heavenly Father, sometimes we feel as though what we do doesn't matter and that our faith doesn't make a difference because we are distracted by all the weeds in life. The problems and difficulties and frustrations that crop up and are so often beyond our control. But as Tom has reminded us, even the tiniest amount of faith can grow into something that has a lasting impact, not just now, but for generations to come. And so Lord, please help each one of us to accept Tom's challenge to us this day, to actively cause our faith to grow by being like the farmer and refusing to focus on the weeds, and instead focusing on the wheat, or in our case, our faith and the ways we can and do make a difference with what we do and say. Loving God, as we pray for our church family near and far, we pray for all those dealing with ongoing medical issues. We pray for those awaiting the results of medical tests, for those who are undergoing treatment, for those who are awaiting treatment or surgery. We pray especially today for Alvina Wood, who is in hospital, that you will guide and direct the doctors and nurses providing her care and that she will be strengthened and healed. And we continue to pray for Jeff Sanderson and for Dot Painter and for all those who need a touch from your loving, healing hand. Please strengthen them, we pray. And Lord, we pray for all those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. And we pray especially for the Seaman family this day and our church family as we all mourn Thelma's passing. Lord, we are grieved with what is happening in the world around us. We pray for the families of the victims in Lewiston, Maine, for all those whose lives have been shattered by yet another senseless act of violence. Please give them and those who were injured comfort and strength. And we pray also for the family of the victims in Sault Ste. Marie, that you will comfort and strengthen them as well. We continue to pray for the people of Israel and Palestine that peace will be restored quickly. And we continue to lift up to you the people of Ukraine that the war will end peacefully. As we approach Remembrance Day, dear Lord, we are reminded that peace is possible. And so we pray for an end to all conflict. Loving God, in the midst of the chaos and confusion in our world, we are thankful for the stability of your everlasting love for us. Help us to hold tightly to you and to seek to do and say things that will help our faith to grow. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And our closing praise this morning is, Who's Going to Tell the Story? Who's going to tell the story?